Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Foods Future, Building a Digital Food Chain, the third and final episode in this series of Foods Future. This show is brought to you in partnership with Emily, BioEnterprise, ProAgrica, and Farm Credit Canada. We'll be exploring how we can make our food systems go digital while supporting farmers, retailers, and consumers all at once. Digitization will allow growers to track each step of production, uncovering new opportunities to make food safer and healthier. But we do need farmers, tech providers, food experts, and consumers to come together to do it right. And that's why City Age has brought them all together today. I'm Zara Lani, and I will be your anchor for today's show. I'm a broadcaster and trained meteorologist with a specialty in sustainability and climate change. Thank you all so much for being here today. For today's episode, we have two people joining us today who we have several people rather joining us today who attended our very first Foods Future event back in September of 2020. Thank you everyone for joining us today for building a digital food chain. And today's show is being recorded, so we will distribute it to all attendees at a later date. Before we get started, a few quick notes about the comment section. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, when you comment in the chat section, make sure to direct your comments to everyone. And this way we can all engage and read your comments. For specific questions, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to our speakers and panelists. And this way we can all engage. Um, please also note that live transcription is avail available as well. To enable it, select the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Throughout, we will also have poll questions for the audience to participate in. And we actually have our first one. It's going to pop up on your screen and you'll have the option to choose your answer. So there you have your first question with five options. Um, we encourage you to engage and participate throughout the show. Now we do have introductory words from our sponsors of the Foods Future Fall Series. Dave Smartin is a forward-facing CEO under his guidance BioEnterprise is navigating the shifting Canadian landscape of food, agriculture, and clean technologies, delivering deep impact through high growth scaling projects. Joining Dave is Jacqueline Kina, Managing Director of the Enterprise Machine Intelligence and Learning Initiative, also known as EMILY. Jacqueline is a professional agrologist and holds degrees in agribusiness and public policy. She is a strong advocate for women entrepreneurs and the important role they play in society. We are pleased to be joined by Dave Smartin, CEO of BioEnterprise, and Jacqueline Kina, Managing Director of EMILY. Dave and Jacqueline, I pass it on to you. Hi, good morning. Thanks very much, Zara. Uh, good morning to everyone on the call. I'm really pleased to see so many people join us uh, today from uh, all over. I know people are joining from all over Canada and uh, really all over the world, uh, especially through the recording. Uh, I'm, I just wanted to take a moment and say a few words here uh, at the conclusion of actually the ninth episode in the Foods Future series. I know that for Emily and for BioEnterprise, we are really pleased to be uh, title sponsors of this initiative all the way along. And, and for each of these episodes, I think as of today's session, uh, we will have engaged more than 1,500 people in each of these episodes. Uh, and you can sort of see on the City Age website uh, spanning a broad uh, array of topics that are really topical to digital agriculture. Uh, Emily is an agri-food, uh, an agri-tech accelerator here in the province of Manitoba, and we work across four strategic pillars, innovation and research, intelligent technology integration, skills training and talent development, and capital enablement. And it's this last pillar that we're really pleased to work with BioEnterprise as their regional partner and representative in Manitoba of Canada's agri-food tech engine, helping to support and scale uh, agri-food and digital agriculture startups and scale-ups here in the prairies. Um, so I'm pleased to pass it off to Dave Smartin from BioEnterprise. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, and, and like Jacqueline says, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here um, and to be sponsoring the City Age uh, events. We've been involved since day one with, with Emily on this. Uh, Emily's been a great strategic partner for us across the country. Um, BioEnterprise, I think most of you probably know who we are. Um, we are Canada's food and agri-tech engine. What does that mean? Well, uh, we eat, sleep, and breathe innovation uh, with respect to agriculture, agri-food, and uh, the entire food value chain. Our, our lot in life here is to, is to build strategic advantage 
for Canadian companies and for Canadian agriculture and food. So how do we how do we do this? Well, we seek out innovation, and we apply that innovation through startups and through scale ups, field trials, and ultimately ultimately the commercialization of new technologies that are going to benefit Canada's Canada's uh, sectors. The, the areas we focus on um, typically it, we're looking at increasing productivity, uh, decreasing costs, uh, increasing efficiencies, but it also forms around opening new markets for our companies. Um, and, and, and doing this all with respect to, to making sure that we're, we're uh, cognizant of climate change, sustainability, the circular economy, and all of these other factors that uh, have come to, to, to bear on our sectors over the last 10 years. So this, this type of an event is incredibly important to us. The Canadian government wants to get us from 56 billion in exports and food products to 75 billion in a matter of four years. That's a huge undertaking. So and between Emily and ourselves and others who are involved in the in innovation here, our job is to try and help us get to that point. So hopefully this will be a, 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 an engaging session today. I think we're going to learn a lot about, about digitizing uh, the various factors uh, within the, uh, the food chain. And uh, I look forward to, to this session and uh, to, uh, to any questions that you might have and, co and comments that we might have throughout the entire session. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave and Jacqueline. I've noticed people been jumping in the chat section and saying hello, dropping your comments. I'm coming at you live from Vancouver. There's snow today. Um, and remember, as Dave said, he's going to be around for questions. So do engage and drop your questions in the Q&A sections. And that way our panelists and speakers will be able to see them. It will get lost a little bit in the chat. Now, moving on with our program today, um, you're watching Foods Future, building a digital food chain brought to you by City Age. Now onto the next part of the show, a conversation between two experts in agriculture who are going to set the stage for us with a discussion about traceability, what it is, who it benefits and why it matters. First is Ryan Rizdell, Vice President of Product and Strategy at ProAgrica. Ryan oversees the global product line and strategy for the Ag Solutions Division. He has over 20 years leadership experience in ag retail, leading agronomy teams and R&D product management experience in the distribution channel. Currently, he is focusing on improving grower experiences and driving revenue at retailers through smarter connectivity and data-led insights. Speaking with him is an agribusiness analyst at Upstream Ag Ventures, Shane Thomas. Shane currently publishes Upstream Ag Insights, a newsletter read globally by thousands of leaders in ag agriculture that cover covers essential news and analysis at the intersection of technology, business, and agriculture, while operating an advisory business supporting startup agribusinesses, as well as the largest chemistry seed and fertilizer businesses in the industry. Shane, I'll pass it on to you now. Thanks, Sarah. I'm excited to participate in the event today. Uh, digitization of the farm and the value chain is one of the most talked about concepts in agriculture today because of how it impacts all the way from the downstream aspects or so all the way from the upstream uh, aspects of the farm, downstream all the way to the consumer for fork and all the company players in between. Traceability and transparency throughout the value chains are some of the outcomes we can begin to see from more digitization. And when we think about traceability throughout the value chain, we can see major benefits like increased food safety, lower food waste, and, and increased revenue opportunities for farmers coming from downstream, just to name a few. But there's a lot more going on than that. And Ryan, I'm excited to talk to you today. Given your experience and being a senior yeah. leader at ProAgrica, uh, really looking forward to talking about some of the implications to the industry at, at large. And, and maybe just to start uh, and level set a bit, you know, how do you think about or start to think about a digitized value chain and tra traceability throughout the value chain? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. So as we as we think about and take a step back and look at the industry and kind of what what are what are the barriers or what are what are the things that are standing in the way of of, of moving the industry forward? It re we really start with the grower, right? Because we can start with we can start up the channel and kind of work our way back down. But at the end, at the end of the day, the data that is needed is generated at, at the farm level. So we think about what are the things, what are the barriers that are that you know a producer is facing to make that next leap, that next step into this new market and take advantage of these of these things like carbon credits and understand that, you know, their sustainability footprint and, you know, take advantage of a, a continuous improvement methodology to kind of make, make their operation better over time. And, and really what it, what it comes down to is 
is quite frankly the lack of transparency within within the industry and it, and it really puts the farmer in a precarious situation where they they find their data they generate with the new equipment they've adopted over the recent time or the as, as a new generation comes into the operation and is more tech savvy what we find is their their data is kind of bucketed in multiple places whether it be in a manufacturer app or with their trusted advisor at maybe at a retail or independent provider or maybe within their own computer at their house or you know just there's there's a million different places their data can be bucketed and what we find is they really struggle to pull all that together for that picture and, and you know that that value what we call a value exchange they, they can push back up through the channel yeah, and so it sounds like you know when you when I listen to you, you talk about that really all this starts with with the farmer and and I think what you're you're hitting on too is is the crux of, of a lot of the the challenges when you look at lack of standards and interoperability and all these things right. that we we get to get to talk about and so there's there's a ton of these these different hurdles but what are the sorts of things that you you think or are seeing uh, happening today even that that are working to overcome some of these hurdles and, and begin to move forward yeah. so we can start to see some of the benefits of, of you know the digitized value chain traceability all these things yeah yeah i think when we when we think about this scenario and the situation i mean the the the, the opportunity and, and the value it's, it's really frustrating for us to to you know, not um, provide a solution faster, right? So we think about what are the ways in which we can help? What are some of the things that we see in, in the market? Um, honestly, the, the things that need to be fixed is is, is the, the transparency and the, and the willingness for the entire ag industry, top to bottom, everywhere in between, to really to really understand what it's going to take to move to move us all forward. And right, it's it's, it's supporting it's supporting that producer, whatever market they're in. What we find is, you know, as we work, work across continents with, we have customers in multiple continents. And as we work across those, agronomy really is 90% the same, growing the crop, caring for the crop, you know, really doing the best you can to bring that crop to market. And then even some of the processes after that, you know, there's, there's, we find there's a 10% difference between markets and between regions. And a lot of times we get axle wrapped in that 10%. And that, you know, that really prevents us from making, making the jump to the data, you know, to moving data around seamlessly between products and platforms and really enabling that grower and that trusted advisor to get a good picture of what, of what that farm operation looks like and how to make a sizable benchmarking improvement process to really move them forward and take advantage of some of these things. So for us, it's really, um, really we're really focused on here in the next in the next six to 12 months on enabling finding common value you know and standardization in a manner that's flexible that isn't a barrier for, for persons to use if they so choose um and also to, to really promote the idea of that value exchange between parties on knowing that if we can fundamentally change tweak the attitude a little bit in the industry and pre present a space where it's non-threatening there's no barriers to entry for you know for, for data to flow and, and for standards to be adopted but it's really going to rise the tide on all the ships and there, there trust me there is enough tide to be risen in this industry for everyone to take advantage of it so we're not worried about that we're more worried about fostering an environment where where this can happen to try and move every, move everything forward i think there's much more innovation ahead of us than there is behind us in this space and we're looking forward to to helping ease that pain yeah, and I think that's a huge, huge thing. Like you, you alluded to, it's it's more about growing that that pie versus trying to own your your small right. little slice of the pie. You right. grow the pie bigger and and right. uh, get working together. And really, that starts with with collaboration. And, and you know, we've seen a lot of uh, walled garden approaches in the past. You know, <laughs> you think up really up until yeah. this point, it's still happening, quite frankly, in, in the the industry today. But we're yeah. seeing a ton more more collaboration. And I know, you know, on the the pro agrica side, you guys are, are working at, uh, at managing some of that and so I'm, I'm curious if there's any specific initiatives that that you're excited about specific to ProAgrica or otherwise that that are coming down uh, down the line that you think are going to help move move this uh move this forward faster uh to your earlier points yeah i mean we we've had our ag x platform that we've had for many years right and, and the philosophy around that is standardization across parties to, to to you know to really foster that value exchange that's a really intensive product and process, right? And we recently acquired CDMS, which brought us, you know, some of the, the, re the regulatory assets and the knowledge base around that. So not really looking to announce anything today, but again, we're looking to foster that, that environment within the assets that we have within the organization in a manner that, that promotes that 
cross that cross collaboration between parties and creates and it creates an environment that is non threatening and that is easy to easy to utilize that that really um, really kickstarts that collaboration at any level in the industry and really kind of creates that level playing field where parties can really engage each other and really move this move this situation forward where where a producer or a trusted advisor within that retail channel can really can really dig in deep and understand what the situation is and provide that expert advice to the grower to move it forward. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Just talking about the the trusted advisor and en enabling them and and the farmer all the way all the way along to uh, have be d derive better outcomes and and you know just for for I guess the the group here that maybe isn't direct into the into the agriculture side of things. You know, when I start thinking about some of the implications for for a farmer that that can benefit. You know, you mentioned carbon carbon earlier. Um, right. There's other opportunities that might be you know specific IP uh, initiatives that make it more seamless mm -hmm. for a farmer to participate. Act Access higher premiums that incentivize them to do uh, you know different practices that maybe are desired by consumers or, or anything along those lines. I, I'm curious if there's anything else, any specific examples that that you're more excited about in the uh, uh, call it traceability side or what what uh, could come from a, a digitization perspective. Yeah, I think from a from a digitization, there's from, from what we see and you know in the, the data that we have and what we what we see is an opportunity just immense right and it's just the 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 ability for us to to help foster that environment that, that enables i don't think i don't think producers in any market truly understand the opportunity that's in front of them to take advantage of those markets and it's not that you know it's not that it's anything they have to be afraid of i mean we're from a security or, or data standard standpoint it's it's more of an evolution of of, of the market right the market the market to consumer every, everyone wants to know more today, right? I mean, information is so readily available. The market wants to know that information. So for us specifically around it, you know, an example is just to, to realize that our business has to change with, with the market demands that are out there. And I think for us to build a silo and try and try and house all that, all that within our own company and try and to think that we would be able to, to make an impact on the marketplace, just ourselves is probably a flawed strategy. What we're what we're approaching it now is our position in the industry is one is in, independent of any chemical or seed company, right? We are we are truly a data company looking to connect the dots between parties to enable that that growth and and for organizations to take it and farmers to take advantage of that and really provide that next level um, of transparency and, and quite frankly opportunity for the grower and for the and for the consumer. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the most exciting things to me is an agronomist by background and kind of working my, my entire career in the industry is really, you mentioned the data and, and it being a, a data company. And there's the value of, right. of data all the way along, not in the sense of, hey, I'm making a bunch of money off the data in every single sense of the word, but the data for a farmer to help inform better decisions that, that support them saving right. money or getting a higher yield or higher quality. The uh, better understanding that a grain origination organization or a processor can have to make sure that their, you know, malting business gets more, more effective or their, their uh, grain uh, or bread debt making business gets uh, higher quality outcomes. And, and then the consumer who cannot understand to your point, they want more information. They want to be right. able to see and access and make an informed decision based off of that data and that digitization really connects and creates that bridge, so to speak, for the entire uh, value chain, which I think is is super cool. And I know I think you know with that, I think one of the interesting questions that uh, want to ask, and I'm curious at your take on it, but is there you know if we don't digitize the the industry, is there some is there a, a negative implication, or, or do you see yeah. uh, anything that's that, Call it detrimental for uh, the industry or uh, at large if, if we don't see this uh, begin to take off if we don't see that collaboration that you alluded to moving forward yeah I think kind of kind of a two-pronged approach there first one is if you think about it from the growers perspective today in their environment today right so um, multiple companies whether it be a manufacturer or retailer or you know any kind of even a startup right there's there's a million apps in the in the app store whether regardless of what phone you have, right? There's a million apps. Each one has its own unique value prop and each one has its own unique way of, you know, taking it, you know, helping the farmer today. Um, and what, what I really coach our group on is, you know, if you're a trusted advisor, or if you're a farmer, you have 50 things to do today. So you have no time left, right? There's no time left in the day. So you have 50 things to do. And if, 
your startup or your product or your app or whatever is item number 51, you got to have a pretty significant value added to that operation to get that use adoption and to get and to get that individual to really make that a habit, you know, do it as many times as they need to make it a habit that they have to do it, they have to do it right. I have a good friend who farms a substantial amount of acres in the U.S. and his his joke to me is always, hey, I sit in my chair in the wintertime when I'm not hauling grain and I'm downloading all these apps and doing all this stuff and it's great. But at the end of the growing season, all the one I really care about is the one that I have to show to my banker to get all my stuff renewed for the next year. Right. So it's from a if we if an industry, if we don't do it, our adoption curve is not going to be fast enough. And the, what what that needs is information to pass between parties to really to really get that ease of change, the ease of the pain of change really really decrease down. So you're inserting yourself and taking that 50 to a 49 to a 48 to a 47. And if we don't do that as an industry, we'll have outside, you know, you, you start to lose that influence from the ground level, right? So from a seeds and traits perspective, you have the most advanced seeds in the market in the world right now that can produce unimaginable amount of yield, whether whatever crop you're in, right? You have, you have chemistries that are tailored to the to the weed control environments. You have all these things, you have specialty fertilizers you can apply and all these things. If you don't take advantage of those, essentially what you're doing, and we kind of talked about this in the in the pre-call that we had, is you have the most advanced seeds in the most advanced planter, planting the most advanced crops and situation in the world, and you're pulling it with a with a lawnmower, right? I mean, you're just not harnessing you're not harnessing the power of all the investment the industry poured into that, right? So if we cannot share and collaborate within the industry and, and create a space where that where that grower, that trusted advisor is easily easily adopted, there's no barriers, there's 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 nothing standing in their way to self improvement and you know working your way into the workflows of the day so you're not a barrier. That's the approach we need to take as an industry. And if, you know, if, if we don't, it's going to be slow and, and, the, and the influence is going to start moving away from the industry groups and the producers themselves to probably outside influences, which is probably not in the best interest, interest for the industry. Growers want to grow crops responsibly, I believe. Yeah. And, and, and if we don't advocate and if we don't adopt and if we don't keep, keep moving forward as an industry, it's, it, it's going to be difficult, difficult for us to communicate the good things that we're doing as an industry and, and articulate the fine points that consumers want to know now about the food that is grown and how it's grown. Um, so if it's kind of a bigger audacious answer, you know, but I think I think we just we need to we need to really come to grips and that, that in this new market that we're in with consumer demand and everything else we we have to we have to work together. So. Yeah, Ryan, I think you you nailed that. That was uh, an excellent expl explanation. Like just in terms of what it can unlock from from potential for for the farmer for the for the value chain. But I think it, the point that just stood out there to me is is you know about traceability and digitization enables the the um, ability for a farmer and for the industry to communicate the good things, the things that are being done to right. uh, grow responsibly grow high quality foods and, and make sure that uh, consumers are getting what's uh, what's best for, for them and the environment is, is being taken care of uh, within that as well too. And so, you know, I, I think with that, that's uh, about as good of a uh, explanation as we can really see in terms of just the value that, that digitization yeah. can create. I mean, is there, is there any other final comments you, you wanted to uh, throw in there before, uh, before we throw it back over to Zara? No, I think it's uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Looking forward to staying connected in this, in this circle and, and, and updating and working together and in, in the future. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great talking with you, Ryan. And, and, uh, you know, I think for everybody listening, I think this just Ryan's points just really reinforce the, the exciting opportunities for the egg industry, for consumers and, and what can really come from uh, digitizing the value chain and how traceability can begin to unlock opportunities and, and really support all the things we, we talk about. So, Tons of exciting things coming and, and uh, looking forward to seeing more of what, what you and ProAgri could do moving forward as well, too. So thanks a lot, Ryan. And, and uh, with that, Zara, back over to you. Thank you so much, Shane and Ryan. Great, informative discussion. We really appreciate you being here. And you at home, thank you for joining us. You're watching Food's Future, building a digital food chain. And thank you to our sponsors, BioEnterprise, Emily, FCC, and ProAgrica. I'm your anchor, Zara Alani. Now, before we get to our first panel discussion, let's take a look at the results from our first poll question. There it is, it pops up on your screen for you, for you and almost half of you chose option one. 
Now we do have a second poll question for you. It's gonna also pop up on your screen. You have four options to choose from. Please engage, choose your best answer, and then we will reveal the results later on throughout the episode. Now on to our first panel discussion, farmers and digitization. Our panel consists of leaders in ag tech and farming. They're joining us to discuss how digitization begins on the farm. First, we have Laura Lee, the Director of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships at Combine Ag. Laura holds an ag engineering degree from Ohio State University. She's focused on finding the balance between innovation and tradition in agriculture. And she also centers her career around seeing both sides of the coin in the industry. Next up is Daniel St. George. Daniel is a certified business architect and associate partner for IBM, Canada's enterprise strategy practice. He has significant business agriculture, sorry, architecture, strategy, consulting, and analytics experience across multiple industries. And those include agriculture, financial services, healthcare, utilities, local government, hospitality, tourism, and education. We also have up Bethany Deshpandi, the CEO of Soma Detect. She has more than a decade of experience in science and entrepreneurship. She insists on asking questions like a scientist, demanding the precision of a surgeon, and taking risks like an artist. She believes that planning is everything, but also understands that the plan is nothing. Rob Stone, owner and operator of Stone Farms, He's into, it's a, zero to, uh, it's a zero till direct seeding grain and oilseed farm in the Davidson area with his parents, wife and two sons, nine and 11 years old, who continue to develop a keen interest in the business. They grow a diverse mix of lentils, wheat, barley, canola, and dabble in other crops. Rob received his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Agronomy in 1999 and can remember a time when dot matrix printers were a thing. Rob is active on social media, particularly Twitter, and sees it as a great way to connect with fellow farmers, legislators, industry partners, and the general public. And hosting our panel is Joe Dales. In 1997, Joe co-founded agcareers.com with his wife, Sandra, one of the first ag business websites on the internet. In 1998, he co-founded farms.com limited, which has grown to become a leading supplier of innovative solutions to farmers, agriculture, and food companies around the globe. Finally, in 2019, he co-founded RH Accelerator Inc. and leads their value-adding investments in the agriculture, food and innovation, and startup sector. He loves the space where innovation meets agriculture. Joe, I'll pass it on to you now. Thanks, everybody. We're really excited to uh, continue the discussion here on uh, how we unlock the potential of uh, capturing data and turning it into, uh, into value. So really excited about this. Um, first, uh, a couple of comments uh, um, based on the first uh, panel here before we, we start chatting. Um, farmers, in my mind, in my experience, really want and need innovation. Uh, you know, agriculture is a tough, competitive global marketplace and farmers need lots of support. So we'll try to uh, uh, bring that out in the discussion here when we're chatting with, uh, with Rob a little bit earlier. Um, I go back a few years uh, when I used to chat with my grandfather and my father, and in the 30s, they were using horses. Um, I didn't experience that. Uh, but then, you know, 22, 23 years ago, you know, the internet was just emerging. And so, you know, you can see the progression. And I think now we've got a wonderful foundation with all these technologies to uh, enable farmers and agribusiness to you know, improve things, be more productive, more profitable. So I'm really excited about this panel today. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting too, just seeing some of the uh, people in the chat. We have people from Mexico and I think, uh, you know, really around the world. And so uh, pretty amazing to be calling, uh, you know, our friend, uh, our friend Rob from uh, Saskatchewan to chat a little bit uh, about his farm. So uh, thanks City Age and the sponsors for, uh, for this panel. And, uh, you know, we could continue the discussion on digitization. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Rob. And uh, Rob, can you tell us a little bit about your farming operation? Sure. Uh, so we farm in Davidson, central Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a family farm. As mentioned earlier, oil seeds, pulses, and rotation with some cereals, minimize disease, maximize economic benefit uh, sort of thing. Uh, minimum tillage, zero tillage, those sorts of things that were developed in the 80s and 90s. Uh, in response to 
the needs of soil erosion and all of the uh, practical needs of trying to uh, preserve our best resource that's underneath our feet that provides a living for us all. Um, we've we've been a farm here since 1904, so we've seen all the all of the changes that you talked about. Of course, I wasn't here for a lot of them, uh, but uh, certainly familiar with our legacy of uh, of basically continuing to innovate. Um, that's, uh, you know, we've, we've gone from, from the horses, like you said, to uh, variable rate, sectional control, zero tillage, all of these different things that uh, involves technology uh, and uh, always kind of pushing some boundaries on the, uh, on the things that uh, the industry needs to provide for us. Oh, that's great. What, uh, you know, if you look forward, um, what are some of those technology barriers or just, just general barriers or challenges uh, before you start adopting, uh, you know, new uh, new things that you're starting to hear about down the road. Well, I think it's uh, the the legacy of having poor data connectivity in uh, in rural areas has been an ongoing concern with a lot of these uh, a lot of these things. It's getting better. Uh, cellular data is getting better. You know, I think there was a question about uh, on the on the Q and A about. Uh, the uh, Starlink service, which I've got mine ordered, it's it's not here, and we've got decent access. I've, my picture is actually coming through, and I'm using internet, so that's good. Um, but I think that you know, on the adoption curve and stuff like that, is just that we have a history of uh, data and connection and all of these different apps that uh, that Ryan and, and Shane were talking about earlier. That uh, we're just not familiar with them, and we've really seen little value to adapting to a lot of these things beyond the Excel spreadsheet, which I'm still quite familiar and happy using. So that's some of the, some of those things that makes sense. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I just want to dive into a point you just made about seeing value. Uh, what advice, and we'll dig into this a little bit later on with the rest of the panel, but what advice can you provide uh, technology providers, uh, your suppliers, um, on how how they can help farmers, how they can bring some of these new innovations and and uh, you know help you on your farm. Yeah, I think the, the a lot of the things that I see right now is we're we're doing it because we can. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there, and uh, it it needs to get above the fifty first uh, thing that we want to do on our on our list of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, sorry. Um, so how, how do we how do we get the I don't know how do we how do we get us involved? Um, the desire to use it and, and financial benefit, I guess, is is what really it comes down to, right? Mm -hmm. If if it's neat and cool and organized and everything else and it's got bells and whistles, it works for a while, but then you kind of drift from it. But if there's a, a clear financial benefit to us um, participating in this and learning things that we're not comfortable with, I might add, I, I don't like data. I don't like the tech stuff. I like farming. I'm really mm -hmm. passionate about growing things and, and making all of those decisions. And using data to make those decisions is important, and I, I rely on it. But to have the, the newest iPhone and the neatest widget, I'm not. Uh, it creates more pain than it's worth. So that's kind of my, my honest view of, of, of those sorts of things. But, but because there's so much available and there's so much potential to that, because we're getting into traceability, we're getting into this carbon market, and the bottom line is, is that we own, uh, we own the data. We create the data, so all of these apps that plug into it should enable us to be able to uh, leverage that. If, mm -hmm. if that's uh, a good overview on that. No, I, I think uh, you know when I chat with farmers, uh, same thing. They don't want to know how the watch works. They just want to know what time it is and save me yeah. time, save me money you know, make me money, help me stay in business. Uh, those are, you know, because you've got, a, as you say, 51 things on your, on your plate and, uh, and uh, no, that's wonderful. No, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing so honestly. And, uh, you know, we'll get back to you in a minute. I just want to engage the rest of our panel before we, uh, before we go too much further. Um, thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Laura Lee, would you kind of introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about Combine um, and talk to talk to what you're trying to bring to the marketplace with Combine that, that will benefit farmers. Yeah, sure thing. So hi, everyone. Great to be here today. I think we got a, a interesting start so far. 
Um, so I'm director of business development and partnerships at Combine Ag. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm originally from Ohio. I hold a degree in ag engineering from, from the Ohio State University, I have to say. Uh, previously worked for a crop inputs company called KWS, so was a part of a corporate innovation team there that was focused on uh, partnerships with early stage ag tech companies. So partnerships with, with ag tech is kind of what I've, I've lived and breathed for the last few years, and, and that's primarily what I focus on at, at Combine. So to, to back up a bit, Combine, we are an early stage software company. Uh, we make tools for farmers. So we have what we call a crop marketing hub, which is basically a software tool that enables a farmer to keep track of their important trade information. So things like their, uh, their contracts, their, uh, their crop inventory, um, offers, marketed position, that type of thing. And then we're also largely focused on uh, decision support. So I'm, I'm glad that Rob mentioned that earlier because in addition to just record keeping around that important trade data, we're really focused on um, taking that and enabling farmers to make more informed and timely grain marketing decisions. So that's really the value that, that we're trying to push for. Um, if, if we look at the grain industry today, um, there's a level of sophistication that grain buyers have, right? They have a lot of really interesting products and tools that they can do or use and do um, to do really complicated things in, in grain like hedging and just really optimize their origination. We want to bring that value to the farmer level. So we want to empower farmers to have that level of sophistication and have those tools that help them just become better at marketing their grain. Um, so that's what that's what we do. And I am looking forward to today's, today's chat. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think we've all seen, you know, tremendous swings in commodity prices. So uh, um, I know most farmers uh, are always kicking themselves because they always want to hit the highs and and uh, seldom do, at least at least in my my uh, humble opinion, I never hit the highs very often. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm going to move on to Daniel. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, Daniel St. George is with IBM. Uh, and everybody knows IBM, great global leading technology company. Daniel, can you share a, a little bit of your experience uh, working in the agri-food industry and uh, look forward a little bit in agriculture and how, how uh, farmers and agribusiness can benefit from you know, some of these new technology innovations coming down the pipeline? Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, great, to, great to be here too. Thank you to City Age, everyone, the panelists and the people who have joined um, this great event. Thanks to, uh, to Rob for your, um, your honest assessment of where you're at. Um, and I think there's a lot of us uh, that can, can look at uh, your experience and other people's experience to get a, a grip on where we're at right now in terms of uh, the industry and our maturity, uh, frankly, in this space. So, so you know, IBM is, uh, as you said, 100 plus old company. We work in the, in the we, we call ourselves a cloud and an AI or cognitive company. Um, we have solutions and, and services uh, in the agri-food, uh, agribusiness space from um, our blockchain work, uh, addressing sustainability, food waste, food traceability, to our uh, environmental intelligence suite, looking at uh, sustainability and, and weather powering analytics. But I think, and I think an important aspect of all of this is um, really was brought up by, by um, Ryan and, and, and Shane in the previous area is how do we address these these big challenges that we're facing now, like Rob's facing around things like um, fragmentation of, of technology, interoperability or the lack of interoperability between solutions. Um, user experience, I think is a big one. We often forget that, you know, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the barriers to uptake of this stuff is, is, is a poor user experience. And if it's not part of that top 50, um, you know, solving some of those problems, uh, then then it just doesn't make the it doesn't deliver the value needed. So I think um, you know understanding uh, how to solve those problems and and where we think I, I think is important where we're seeing the industry going and and I like to to talk a lot about other industries too. And as much as we talk about ag being quite nuanced and different, there are similarities to other industries. I've worked in areas like healthcare, and I think. Um, 
there's a lot of similarities between the maturity that healthcare um, went through in terms of fragmentation, interoperability, still nowhere near there, but it's, it's probably a little ahead of agriculture and looking across at how they solve those problems. We believe this concept of ecosystems or partnerships, open platforms, is uh, a concept that is important to solve some of these things. So you're starting to see some of that in the industry at, at the moment with partnerships, um, et cetera. But I think that's an area that is uh, certainly interesting, interesting and, and uh, uh, something that IBM is playing a large part in helping uh, partners across the, the food value chain to uh, solve some of these problems too. Fabulous. Look forward to uh, chatting with you a little bit later too. Uh, Bethany, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? And uh, uh, for the people that aren't familiar with Soma Detect, uh, explain what you do and what you're, uh, the market you're addressing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Bethany, CEO of Soma Detect. I am a biologist by training who somewhat fell into the agricultural industry. And so when we started, it was, um, I had so much to learn, which uh, was really only achieved by knocking on barn doors and working very directly right on the ground with um, farmers that were, that, well, that obviously had years and years and generations and generations more experience than, than I ever could. And so um, the company is, we're a startup company that does uh, inline milk quality testing for dairy farmers. So we don't work on crops. We work um, really in the livestock space and um, in dairy and which is just, it really is a wonderful place to be. And so, um, yeah, our technology is all about, uh, you know, getting as much data from the milk quality uh, factors, health factors, different things like that, and then giving farmers information so that they can make uh, quick management decisions as they go through their day. Terrific. Now the challenging part, gang, we've got three major topics we wanted to address really quickly, five minutes per topic. Um, I, want you, I want you all just, you know, sharing some quick thoughts so we can have these discussions with, uh, with uh, you know, for our audience here. So the first one, um, you know, what are the barriers, challenges, issues in digitization that you see? Uh, you know, Laura, let's start off with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a big question. Um, so, so Combine was actually started by uh, two guys who come from farming families. So we originally set out to solve, you know, pain points that they themselves and their families have experienced when it comes to marketing their grain. Um, so a, a big obstacle that, that we've faced or that we've seen from the, those experiences, just a general lack of farmers being able to access their own data. And I don't know if this is something that's unique to grain marketing. I've, I've not seen this really replicated in other areas of ag, but if you take, for example, when you know, a farmer sells their grain to a, to a buyer, that record of sale, you know, the contract, it's actually in the buyer system. And it's in fact, very difficult for a farmer to just directly access that themselves. They can access it through you know, uh, the buyer system. Um, but in the case of you know, when the buyer system goes down, and we talked a little bit about this with, with uh, Rob earlier, they can be in a bit of a pickle. So uh, we've, we've tried to solve that through um, integrations. Uh, I mentioned earlier that partnerships is a big piece of what I focus on. I think generally the theme today is you know, data interoperability. So we've tried or we've built Combine out with the goal in mind of, of making it um, purposefully connected to tools on both the farmer and the buyer sides. So we can, you know, help a farmer get access to that information that might be, you know, behind a walled garden in their buy system um, and help them actually access that, that information when it's across multiple buyer systems as well. So that's um, one big barrier we've seen is just general accessibility to data and particularly accessibility from the, from the angle of it's in, you know, someone else's tool. Perfect. Daniel, let her rip. Yeah, listen, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to agree, but you know, a slightly different take is I don't think it's necessarily the responsibility of the farmer or the grower. We talk about data, owning their data, access to data. I think there's a responsibility on the industry to demonstrate value first and foremost. And, um, and even if we talk about the top 50 things a farmer has to do, how can we make that more efficient and effective? And 
And, um, and I think it's up to the industry to be able to do that and demonstrate that value. People like uh, ag retailers are important, crop input companies, a collection of those things to be able to um, make it easier and, and more enjoyable, frankly, uh, in, a, in an experienced way for, for growers to do that. And um, ease of use. And I haven't got yeah, ease of use. Yeah, mm. exactly. And, and it's not necessarily data, I think it's information and yeah. knowledge. It's mm. it's not seen that, that these the, you know farmers aren't necessarily data scientists or or people that can you know they might be able to do a couple of graphs and, and spreadsheets but mm -hmm. it's up to the the uh, industry and players in the industry to be able to provide that information and or knowledge uh, to inform uh, growers um, you know what what to do. Perfect, Bethany. Yeah, I mean so. I have so much to say about that. I love um, Daniel ending that on the sort of, you know, information knowledge um, that that scale. And I think we hear that again and again in in the data space. And certainly, it's very common in in AI and machine learning to talk about, you know, data, information, knowledge, and then wisdom as mm -hmm. as the fourth one. And farmers are like very very rich. There's a ton of data on a farm. There's lots of wisdom, and um, you know, it's like filling in those other those other things and helping to process that data to actually create information and knowledge that's really key. Um, we we definitely, I mean, we're an IoT device on farm. And so certainly, you know, Laura spoke about connectivity as a barrier. I, I love the audience question that came in as uh, making reference to Starlink. We actually work with um, a farm that has the Starlink system in, you know, has actually relatively good internet, but then has Starlink as a backup. And I think that that helps to make their internet connectivity so much more robust than it was ever was before. And I'm really excited to see things like that um, go forward. I, I also think for lots of early stage companies, you're, so much of it is about working with the farmers, working with the customers, and then iterating as quickly as possible to maximize the value that you're providing. And, and that's hard in a lot of industries. I think in, in agriculture, it just, you know, you have no choice but to get in the car and like make that trek to wherever you're going and, and all those things. And um, I think if you're gonna work in this space and not enjoy those things, you're gonna have a really tough time and a lot of grueling days. And so, um, yeah, that's sort of how our approach is, is being as close as possible to the folks that we do work with. Good advice. Rob, tie it all together for us. What? Uh, hey, thanks. What, is it? <laughs> what are all the issues? What are what are a few big things that uh, if you could wave the magic wand and and fix them uh, in the next six to twelve months? What would you fix? Oh boy, yeah. Well, that's a pretty open question, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the things I see is that we're for how much digitized everything we we have. I've got paper all over my desk, and mm -hmm. I like paper. I like the the security of having something in your hand. And I would suggest that there's a lot of people that uh, that have that same sentiment that they're just not ready to let go of whether it's contracting. There you go. Right. You know, I, all my notes are on my on my papers. They're not on my iPhone or in my notes. Um, so and I, I like to think that I'm somewhat progressive. So um, there's there's a whole large percentage of people that are, haven't got to where I am yet with with using some of these tools. So that leads into familiarity, what we're familiar with, how we do business, um, how we do grain contracting, like, uh, like we talked about before, there was quite a, quite a little trust issue with, with all of the system changes and those things. So uh, privacy, uh, if I've got a file locked in my file folder, if somebody steals it, I know that it's gone. But if it's still there, then unless there's some spy camera stuff, you know, but, and that's that whole thing is understanding the system. And we need to see value when we're digitizing all of this stuff. If it saves me time, if it makes it easier to access my records, or if I can increase my production per util or whatever economic term, then, then there's value. But if it's just to do it for the sake of somebody said it would be easier, you, you just, it just stays on the self, shelf. And the amalgamation of companies, the, the, the good idea that starts with an app and it rolls up to a, a larger and larger and larger company and just understanding where all of your stuff is going when you're when you're creating it, storing it, putting it in this cloud that we all talk about. Um, it's really always comes back to just understanding how this system works and how how far we've got to go to understanding 
it's because if I can't understand it or if somebody else can't understand it, there's a very low likelihood that I want to be involved in it. Yeah, great point. Um, my brother is a partner in a large farming operation and I'll, I'll tell him about all these new technologies and, you know, usually he just rolls his eyes and uh, says, all right, I, I'm really busy and I don't have an IT department. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. if it doesn't work on my phone, um, make it easy for me. So saving them time uh, to help them make money, I think is a critical, critical point here. Um, Want to spend a, a couple of minutes, we can't spend very much time on it, but privacy of data, ownership of data, liability issues. Uh, Daniel, can you hit hit this topic for a little bit? Uh, what should we be thinking about in the supply chain, both as farmers and agribusiness? Yeah, this is a interesting topic. I, you know, I debate this topic quite a bit with, with people in the industry. Um, I, you know, I relate a lot of it to, to data that we, we share in other, in other industries as well, such as healthcare or financial data. <clears throat> I think it's a, a little bit of a, I think it's, it's important. And it's, I think the important bit to understand is, I don't, I don't want to speak on behalf of growers necessarily, but I think um, anytime we share data, really what we're trying to get back is is what value is that going to have to both my operation me personally my business and even the industry as a whole and i think if you can connect those dots and people better understand how the data is being used and what it's being used for and the value that's generated i think people are going to be more willing to to you know share that data um, if they if they're not already it's, it's similar to, to the finance industry or, or even even healthcare in a little bit of a way, but um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, see what I have next year. Bethany, what do you think on the whole privacy and data? Because you're generating a lot of data from dairy farmers. We are, we're generating a lot of data. We're also using their existing data sets to provide context to the data that we create. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to what you know what are the rules around the data how do we share that data effectively because the reality too that we run in what um the way they said in dairy they they don't want to look at another screen but i i you know the dairy industry they have their herd management so you know people don't want more software they want greater functionality and greater value out of the things that they are doing and the things that they are using and so how do we get our data back into these systems um in a meaningful way while still protecting, you know, our part, the part of our business and, and those kinds of things too. And so I think I, I, when I started, I used to think these were like really easy questions to like, oh, well, other industries have figured this out. And how is it that this is still such a big conversation? And I um, have just come to appreciate, you know, it is, it is a big conversation and every single farm is its own business. And they all have, you know, every farmer that we work with has different understanding expectations um, in terms of what happens with their data and where it goes and and all these things and in the value piece you know there's this nobody loves the feeling that something they create is being used to make someone else a ton of money without them getting anything back for that and and of course they wouldn't right and so how do we acknowledge that effectively how do we quantify that in a meaningful way too because um you know, and, and how do we maximize the benefits to the farm, uh, you know, who's actually contributing their data? So these are, none of them are simple questions. Uh, and then, and then all this ultimately ends up, you know, we, we find, we read through a lot of, not me personally, but, but folks in, in the business will read through data agreements and all these different things. And for anyone in the room who's done, I'm sure many of us have, have tried to work our way through some of these, like they're, these are complicated documents. They're, um, really difficult to wrap your head around. And sometimes they're intentionally ambiguous because it's safer to be ambiguous than to really take a stance here. And so it's a it's a conversation in flux. I think um, we've taken the approach, given the type of data that we generate and it's a rather unique data set, we sort of take the approach that the more folks that use our data, the better off or the greater the benefit for our company um, as a whole. So whether that's the farm, 
uh, the vet, the nutritionist, the, you know, industry around, um, the more people we have looking at using parsing that data and bringing it from raw numbers to the information and knowledge that we're talking about, the better it is for our farmers and ultimately the best it is for our business and what we're trying to achieve. Rob, uh, how do you think about, you know, your farm's data and who do you share it with uh, and, and why? Um, we only have a minute if uh, you can. Yeah, sure. Okay, so yeah, I've <laughs> got fragments. Into a bottle. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll compress it. I've, I've got fragments of data everywhere for probably the last 10 years off of our yield monitors and every little thing that you signed up with said share with us or whatever else. So we've got stuff all over the place right now. And we certainly want to clean that up uh, in, in the future, knowing, knowing where it goes. Because like was suggested, we don't like the idea of somebody making a bundle of money off of us. We want to be partners in this. And we want to know that our data is, is meaningful and in, in being used well. And as we go forward into all of the, the, the carbon and all of these sorts of things and the liability for your activities and those sorts of things, this stuff's it's really important knowing who's got access to know what you're doing. That's terrific. Um, we're down to one minute here. Laura, can you um, just let people know how they can get a hold of you if they want to follow up with you and Combine? And we'll just go around around the table here and make sure you know, we've run out of time today, but I uh, want to make sure people engage if they're interested in more information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but one quick thing I'd add on, on the last data topic is Combine is ADT certified. So Ag Data Transparent, that's been an uh, uh, important focus for us as an early stage company. Basically, that's just us agreeing to abide by a set of core principles that ADT sets out around fair usage of farmer data. Uh, so it helps us be a, a, a bit more transparent about what we're doing with, with pharma data by, by following that certification. Um, you can reach me at l.lee at combine.ag, also active on LinkedIn. Um, always happy to talk through you know, ways that we could better connect Combine to tools on both the pharma and the buyer sides, if that sounds like something that you want to get into a conversation about. Um, let me know. Always happy to chat. Bethany, how can they uh, hunt you down? Great. I can be found on LinkedIn or um, via our website, somadetect.com. Terrific. Daniel? LinkedIn, pull the way. And Rob, uh, hopefully we won't pester you too much with your busy schedule, but if they want uh, some farmer feedback, how uh, I know I follow you on Twitter and I'm a big fan of yours. So, Well, gee, shucks. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, RGStone1. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Or uh, if you happen to be in central Saskatchewan, stop by the farm for a tour and we'd uh, love to buy you a beverage. We're, we're on our way. We're on our way. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and Zara, we'll pass it back to you on time. And uh, thank you so much, panel, for sharing. Um, you know, if you're interested, reach out to the panel if you have other questions and, and uh, we'll pass it back to the, the host. Hey, thank you so much. That was an amazing discussion. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have the results from our last poll question. It is going to pop up on your screen and you'll see that uh, majority, more than half of you chose the first option. We also do have another question for you. What will build farmers' trust in digitizing their records? That pops up. You have four options to choose from. Please do make your decision, and we will reveal the result later in this episode. Now, it's time for our next panel discussion on how to scale and standardize digitization. The panel will tackle how to connect and digitize the value chain and decide on standards across the industry. Also, they'll discuss questions like, where does blockchain fit in? Do we need a regulatory body? Our next panelists are going to help us figure all of that out. First is Raja Ramachandran, the co-founder of a tech company helping the food supply chain achieve transparency, efficiency, and improved value to solve problems around traceability, food safety, quality assurance, and regulatory compliance. Raja was most recently on the founding team at R3CEV to deploy distributed ledger and blockchain solutions. Kate Withers Hess, co-founder of Functionland, exploring data ownership while building blockchain attached storage and the Borg protocol. She is also the co-founder of Partrunner, a bootstrap startup in the construction and agri-services space. Kate studied cropping systems agronomy at Michigan State University and the University of Guelph. She currently helps advise companies on fundraising partnerships, commercialization, and AI implementation. 
Also, we have Scott Ross, the Assistant Executive Director of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. He's a strong advocate for Canadian agriculture, committed to working collaboratively with industry and government stakeholders to advocate for effective agricultural policy solutions. He has a focus on promoting long-term agricultural competitiveness, rural sustainability, economic development, and continual innovation. We also have on today's panel, Darcy Haruff, the Director of Farm Credit Canada. Darcy has had a 20 year career in agriculture, 16 of which was spent with Farm Credit Canada in a variety of roles in finance, information technology, and marketing. He currently leads Farm Credit Canada's Ag Expert Division, which builds and supports solid and simple software that helps farmers digitize their farm records. He holds a business degree from the University of Regina and farms with his family in southeastern Saskatchewan. And our panel host today is Dan Lucier, Project Manager of Agri-Food Data at Emily. Dan is leading Emily's work to support the responsible use of data and data-intensive technology in the agriculture and food sector. Dan is a mechanical engineer by training and has previously worked in public policy for the federal government and in advanced manufacturing at UBC. Dan, thank you so much for leading the discussion, and now I'll pass it on to you. Well, thanks a lot, Zara. Um, great to be here with everyone today, and uh, I'm certainly excited for the panel. I think we have a chance here over the next 30 minutes or so to kind of build on that last uh, conversation that uh, that just took place, uh, you know, set the table and thinking about uh, some of the issues that certainly the sector is facing in the, in the context of data and then and, and digital tech. Um, so I guess when I'm thinking about it, my role here is just as the pan as the moderator, I want to make sure we're hearing mostly from our panelists, first and foremost, and that we can try to get a good conversation going. Um, but I guess what I want to try and do as well is think about, you know, how do we bring this all together? Uh, you know, we're thinking about the value chain as a whole, we're thinking about you know, the opportunities that it means uh, that that technology and data can bring uh, across the length and breadth of the sector and, and uh, you know, what needs to be done to, to kind of put it all together, create that value and, uh, you know, do it in a way that uh, folks right across in different roles are feeling both comfortable, uh, valued, and of course, uh, you know, finding their way through what is at this point, you know, complex and technical and so on. And, and uh, you know, we got to, there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think it's at the same time, it's very exciting. So, uh, you know, given that we've already done the introductions, if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of jump straight in and we'll, uh, we'll get to the questions and answers and, and uh, try to get some discussion going. So um, maybe just to lead off, Darcy, I'll, I'll just pull your name out of the, out of the hat here first. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to, to start things off, as someone who's both a, you know, a technologist at FCC and in the Ag Expert team, but also a grower, um, I think it'd be really great to hear from you directly on, on how you see, um, you know, ag tech and technology creating that value for producers. You heard a lot about that from the last panel, um, but how that, you know, translates into a competitive advantage for either that, that grower or others in the value chain. Um, but, you know, focusing on that value piece, because it seems to be really the cornerstone of, of, you know, why we make this to these investments and where we need to go in terms of communicating with, uh, with folks on the ground. Yeah, good morning, uh, afternoon and evening, I guess, to everybody that uh, I see we have people from around the world here. And, and it's, a, it's a great question, Dan. And it's one, obviously, in my role, um, you know, leading a team that's creating technology to help farmers digitize. It's one we talk about all the time. Uh, and then on the farmer side, as a farmer, I, it's also one, obviously, that's I'm dearly vested in uh, as well. Um, so I, I always talk about solid and simple. So whatever technology we produce for farmers, it has to work when they need it. It has to be simple enough for anybody on the farm to use. Um, you know, and the third one, it, it has to actually be built for farmers. So it has to be solving a problem um, that they're experiencing on their operation. And that's really no different than any other business software that's that's being made for any, any businesses out there. Um, you know, and, and maybe then, you know, on the tangible problem, if it's solving something tangible and it's adding value, that value has to be easily identifiable by the, you know, by the user. Um, you know, and we, we take the position that, you know, we're dealing with a whole bunch of really sophisticated business people. That's what farmers are at the end of the day. They're making, you know, hundreds of decisions, it seems, or at least, you know, uh, making decisions all the time. And that, you know, that thing of fifth, you know, that example of 50 things on my checklist is an actual true example. It's always something better to do. So 
if you build something that's simple enough that you can explain the value prop, that farmers can understand how it solves a problem in their life or how it makes something better on the farm, makes them more profitable, makes them, you know, have more free time. Um, and in a, in a solution that's trusted, I think, you know, that's how we get a, and help, you know, some of the, some of our customers and, and we feel mostly in Canada. That's how we get them to understand that, hey, there's some value by doing this because it takes time to digitize your, your records. It, it doesn't happen out automatically. And it doesn't matter if it's coming from machine technology. Um, at the end of the day, somebody still has to spend time getting it together, putting it on a platform. And I know on, on our side, we just, we focus on, on trying to do it in the, the simplest way and a solution that's solid in there when farmers need it uh, and, and something that's built, you know, for them or with them in mind. So when, uh, scratching the surface a little bit there on, on you know, talking about the small businesses and they're having to make decisions. I think that's a really great lens thinking about, you know, whether it's, whether it's growers or anyone else in the value chain, lots and lots of small businesses, everyone's got their own challenges they're facing. You know, thinking about growers in particular, they're facing with that, that annual cycle. They're, they're growing a crop, many in, in terms of grains and oil seeds, they're growing that crop and then it, it has, it is what it is. And then they're re, re going through that cycle again the next year. How much, how much change and how many decisions in terms of changing your like say tool set or whatnot do you think folks are making year to year how much are you comfortable with making year to year because my guess is we're not talking about you know wholesale changes you're talking about you know making incre incremental decisions here and there and, and maintaining other things in place what, what's your take on on that piece there in terms of how much change year to year folks are often comfortable with well i don't know if it's a matter of what a farmer's comfortable with because change just happens um sure. especially on the farm right we don't you know farmers can't control weather they can't control really you know really the cost we get for our products we can't control input costs other than we can put more or less on um and you know and so when i say making decisions are always making decisions they might not seem like they're not all big decisions mm -hmm. um but when we look for technology we focus on technology that actually helps them optimize their decision making process right so we have an accounting product and a field management product uh and what we really want to do is is give farmers some comfort um, that, hey, you have some data available on your phone or your, or your laptop that'll help you optimize your decision-making process and hopefully, hopefully see that, um, you know, you're making it a little bit more confidence. Now, as far as adopting change on the farm, I guess it, it comes back to the value statement, Dan. It's how much value does that change bring my farm and, and is it tangible? Mm -hmm doesn't always have to be monetary, but is it tangible? And then as right. a business person, I have to figure out if it's, it's worthwhile for me on my farm to, to make that change or do something different. And I think technology is part of that, right? Whether it's Makes equipment sense. or technology, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, before we get too far along, I did wanna sort of switch gears a little bit and go in Kate's direction here. Um, really because we, at the top, the, the word blockchain was mentioned and you know, and that's maybe something that folks aren't necessarily uh, you know, super familiar with. So I think it'd be great to have a, just a, a quick hit at the beginning here on what exactly is, is blockchain and, and where it might fit and what, what, what is its promise relative to kind of that vision that Darcy laid out in terms of creating, creating value within, within whether it's on farm or, or elsewhere in the value chain. Uh, Cause I don't want it to, uh, I don't want to just leave it hanging out there as a buzzword, but rather, you know, more tangibly, what can we, what is it, where does it fit in and what exactly are we talking about here? Okay, yes, uh, thanks, Dan. So, yes, I am the co founder of a blockchain or Web3 company called Function Land. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I've got some two devices mm -hmm. going. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, but before that, as I said, I've studied at Guelph and at Michigan State. I've worked with farmers in extension uh, capacities. We've looked at, you know, uh, biomass feedstocks and carbon sequestration, carbon credits, all these types of things. Um, but really, a lot of the discussions we we're having at the time, and even since I've been working with startups and SMEs to try and see, um, to help them de-risk or attract investment. And I have worked with some of these blockchain enabled companies that work in the ag tech space, let's say, you know, and the argument, the conversation's always been around traceability, always, or, um, and then, you know, Toronto, these there are these FinTech conversations, but really there's been a huge advancement in blockchain and Web3. And I think we should put all of the dogma and ideas and everything we have completely to the side and think of it like we do at Function Land when we're talking about consumers, but farmers, I think it's a very important thing to do as well. Think of it from first principles and say, it's all very well saying, let's just digitize or own your data, but how we digitize and how we actually own our data, those are actually very fundamental questions right at the outset. So we'll get into this perhaps more, but I'm saying 
with these new Web3, there's like new blockchain layers coming on board. There are companies such as, let's say, General Mills coming forward and saying, we want to be able to put a regenerative ag sticker you know, on our box saying, you know, this cereal is produced with regenerative ag practices. And, you know, maybe we can get there with a voluntary credit market or voluntarily saying, you know, I'm a farmer, I employ these regenerative ag practices. We can audit it in this trustless, autonomous way with this tool. It gets updated to the ledger and, um, you know, and that verification can happen. Maybe we don't really need the policy and the regulatory aspect and the traceability and all that as central as we've always thought. Again, this is voluntary market, I'm, I'm saying. But um, I just want to make it really well understood. So someone said, well, I'm creating that data on my farm. It's, it's my data that, you know, for putting, using like, a, you know, John Deere implement that's ingesting, creating that data, ingesting it into a cloud that's hosted maybe as a, as a John Deere headquarters or like in a hybrid model or a server. If it's in the cloud, probably not your data. And same thing with like Google Photos. I take photos all, all day long with my camera, upload it to Google Photos. They've been using those photographs all along to train their own AI to develop their own product. So if it's in the cloud, it's not on your own farm where you can see it, probably not your own data. So we have to think from first principles, how can we design hardware or aftermarket tools or sensors or ways to, to derive our own data streams that we can create revenue and income around that's maybe in parallel or aside from what else is going on. Yeah, I'll turn it back to Dan and the panel for now, just the instant blockchain. Sure. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Raja, I'm going to come to you a little bit because I know when we were talking in advance of uh, you know, the session here sort of getting organized, you had an interesting comment on how you guys have evolved your discussion with consumers about the, the guts of the technology, moving that, the, you know, the, the, the say block, words like blockchain and so on, a little bit, little bit into the background and putting, putting uh, you know, value and, and, and solving the needs of customers more forward and letting the necessary technology just respond to that. and and, and I'd love to hear a bit more about that journey and and, and you know how that how your how how you guys as a company have have headed in that direction and what you've taken away from that experience. Yeah, sure. Thanks to uh, City Age and this group and the panel, uh, you know, for allowing me to speak. Um, you know, enjoy being here. Um, I mean, like our evolution came from you know examining the the why of having ledger systems to look at something as disparate as a food supply chain and so we were lucky to test out some early use cases uh with a restaurant called sweet green about utilization of iot devices at uh, at the farm you know in trucks um, and actually spectrometers at the restaurant so that we can determine um, and capture all the data so that you can actually figure out a correlation between the farming, the activities, the participants, and then ultimately, does that result in, say, flavor that matches a menu? So that was a very, very high maintenance, the costly exercise, but it unearthed a lot about what, what happens in a, in a simple food supply chain. We've also had abilities to work with uh, folks like the Dairy Farmers of America, where they want to portray sustainable measures, quality, safety into a consumer app so that people can see it if they click on a, a barcode. And these kinds of things have been done before. Um, to the point of uh, we've had a number of traceability projects, some of which have worked, meaning, you know, does it provide value? Uh, like a large cocoa grower, we were uh, consuming a lot of uh, traceable elements out of Ecuador and Western Africa. And, you know, the key uh, value proposition was <clears throat> quality rejection based on humidity. And so, again, these are the components of data that actually make sense, particularly when it's in a function of, say, context and insight. And then ultimately today, what we found after, you know, all like, and we've got a huge sugar project in Belize where we're trying to transform the sugar production process so that you can improve banking capability for uh, to switch from collateralized lending into credit based lending. And so with all of this, the one thing that we've seen as a common theme is a continuous trend towards, well, how do I prove sustainability? And the cross section of taking in data from the supply chain around, say, traceability is where we see the future. You know, people want to prove sustainability because consumers, you know, I think I just read a, a report where 59% of consumers would boycott, you know, uh, goods that did not follow sustainable practices. So clearly there's a strong drive by consumers to do all of this. So in that sense, you know, what we have done is blockchain is far less of an issue in terms of 
you know, what is presented as a value proposition. In the end, people don't really care that much about a technology stack as long as you don't have vendor lock-in, right? Oh, I have to choose you versus 12 others. That's where interoperability comes in. And we'll talk about that later, I think. Um, but the but the reality is, is what is the outcomes? What exactly am I achieving as a function of amassing all of this data, creating a network of aligned interest and economic incentives and even data sharing incentives so that everybody has some uplift, whether it's revenue, fulfilling food safety, fulfilling a consumer um, need, you know, particularly around market share. So that, you know, today we really focus on, um, on larger outcomes for ecosystems and, and, large, and a lot of our larger customers have are membership driven. And so we prove it out with the entity so that the producer, the farmer, and also other participants in the chain see the benefit in such a thing. Mm -hmm. well, that's really good. I mean, it's, uh, you know, speaks to that, that's such a diversity of different actors that, you know, getting bogged down in some of the technical details just doesn't necessarily respond to the, the challenges they're facing. And I think it makes a whole lot of sense and sounds like hard one, hard one wisdom, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, switching gears just slightly to uh, to draw Scott into the conversation here. I know CFA is very active in in the, on a whole host of policy files uh, here facing the egg sector in Canada. Can you give us a sense of the most the most pressing issues here that are are in your, are in your, on your desk at the moment, but also where that data literacy piece from from producers and growers fits into making those those move forward and and driving them towards a, an advantageous outcome for for the sector. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dan, and, and to City H for hosting this discussion. I think, I mean, I would note, I looked at the poll earlier, and I mean, for us, from our members, connectivity itself is certainly the kind of most pressing issue. Um, and it's not really just about investing in connectivity, it's about making it work for small rural communities and, and actually getting connectivity down to the field level as well. But, you know, when I'm I'm excited to be part of the panel today because data itself is just such an immense area of opportunity. And as I heard a few others say, I think what's critical to us is ensuring there's clarity and transparency for farmers to understand the value that's there uh, and actually seize those opportunities. And, you know, we certainly see merit in looking at the implications of how farm data is protected in regulation from a privacy and management standpoint, but none of that really harnesses the innovation and tech opportunities mm -hmm. farmers have available to them if they don't have a clear understanding of how their data is actually um, accessed and leverage the greatest benefit. I think that that note in an earlier discussion around data versus knowledge uh, and the value um, that comes with knowledge versus data is a really critical distinction in all of this. I mean, I think Kate's comments earlier about blockchain also just highlight why regulatory discussions may be a little premature in some of these areas, because there just isn't a common understanding yet of the opportunities and challenges. And that diversity of actors you just mentioned is, is kind of front and center to that. There's so much going on here and so many mm -hmm. moving parts that from our perspective, when it comes to data, the starting point right now is digital, digital literacy, as you said and creating an environment that's actually conducive to that developing. So it's not just about informing growers and producers, but making sure that we have uh, collaboration and standardization taking place to the extent we can. And that, you know, we're seeing at the farm level, uh, a recognition that some of the standardization is actually playing out into value at the farm gate and the kind of value driven partnerships I've heard referenced here actually become appealing because there's that tangible benefit and value at the farm level understood and appreciated. So from our perspective, this needs to be driven at a grassroots level, um, this sort of uh, outreach, because I think um, there's often skepticism around technology providers themselves being the sort of vehicle for education in these areas. Um, but I think uh, for, for our work at this point it's really you know first ensuring farmers actually understand who is using their data and how they're using it and and this really just starts from everything from precision and agricultural technologies and the sensors in your in your equipment to um digital supply chain traceability discussions like we're seeing happen in the seed industry for example ultimately what what do we need to have in place to ensure that they can farmers can not only appreciate the value at the farm gate but you know, derive further value from the practices they're employing on farm through initiatives like that. And I think to, to Raj's point, we see a longer term benefit here to, to really leverage this kind of data into sustainability targets, carbon markets. Um, part of our work in this space has been supporting the development of the Canadian Agri-Food Sustainability Initiative, which is in, 
intent is to convene and communicate sustainability and other metrics uh, around that through a common platform to the benefit of producers and their industries as a whole. So um, none of this is really possible if there's that sort of skepticism and a lack of transparency, um, leaving farmers unclear on what opportunities actually look like for them on the ground. And so um, one of the things we've been working with uh, academia and some other associations on is developing a sort of digital um, checklist or toolkit to help inform farmers when they're looking at things like signing technology use agreements or other data sharing documentation. What should they be looking for in this space? How do you make this a competitive landscape where farmers are actually making informed decisions? And I think one of the challenges we've honestly seen so far is finding financial support to get uh, some of the analysis that's needed to be done here to sort of look at agreements that are out there, find commonalities and find ways to communicate that in a fairly um, plain language so that, you know, any farmer, I agree, they're very sophisticated business owners, but they have a lot on their plate and they don't have time to necessarily read through a lot of really technical jargon in this space. So from our perspective, sure. that sort of initial literacy piece is critical. And that's where we really see the, uh, that first starting point to a lot of these broader discussions having to take place. Darcy, can I draw you back in on that uh, that question around, you know, first of all, the literacy piece where you, I know FCC works with growers across, of course, financial side, but also on the tech side. But specifically, Scott was mentioning, you know, understanding agreements. And I know FCC has for a few years been working uh, to bring forward uh, Ag Data Transparent as a way to communicate, you know, what, what it is that you do. And I think it would be great to just talk about, I know it's one piece of a larger puzzle, but it, it speaks to some of that simplifying and making it useful to non-lawyers like uh, I think everywhere around this table. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it would be, I would love to hear a bit more about that and how it kind of interacts with what Scott was saying. Oh, good question. And, you know, we're, we're proud at FCC and Ag Expert to be the first Canadian headquartered company to achieve their Ag Data Transparency Certification. Um, and as part of that, and I think it's a responsibility, um, we've actually encouraged a lot of other um, companies in Canada to, to achieve their ADT certification as well. I think it's important, Dan, and, and what we want to do in the future is create a trusted ecosystem where farmers can share their data. And we want to actually encourage farmers to share their data um, with other companies where they receive some benefit for it. And our customers, and we have, you know, we have over 15,000 spread across the country, have asked, hey, I have my data in Ag Expert. Why can't I share it with my crop insurance provider or my grain marketer or, um, you know, the list goes on. And I think part of that is, is having informed consent, you know, to Scott's point, and I think a few others that we're, that we're speaking about today are agreements, not just at farm credits, but are, you know, other egg technology companies. Agreements have to be simple. They have to be, you know, easy to understand. They can't be 30 pages of small print um you know in in legal jargon uh and and it's a it's a challenge actually to work with our legal department and others to make sure that you know mm -hmm. our users and which are you know um usually well informed to be honest can can understand and and make sense of all these agreements you know we want to we want farmers actually I, I do truly believe farmers own their data in our system we make no rights to individuals data what we want to do is create opportunities where farmers can share that data and get some benefit for it yeah, interesting. I know ADT is like, you know, what is it, a handful of years old, but it is growing, gathering momentum as like at least a way to express um, those complex agreements in a form and in a rubric that folks can see, ah, here are the 15 elements that uh, that they're responding to. And here's our, our sort of their, their more human language responses. And at least for someone on the outside of, of the legal community looking in, it allows someone like me to, to, to look at and go, okay, here's the issues that are being treated in agreement. And it's it seems like a useful step forward, even if it's still there's still lots of other work to do in terms of of literacy and understanding these other implications and how to share it. It's it doesn't address that completely, but it, it feels to me like a piece of a puzzle. I, I think you're right, Dan. And maybe further to that, when farmers choose the, to share their data with another company, um, it should be very explicit what they're choosing to share. If, is it all their data? Is it some of their data? Right. Is it certain pieces of their data? So, you know, I'd, I'd just challenge um, all, of, all of the farmers out there on this call, maybe all the egg tech companies as well, to make sure it's very clear. The worst thing that can happen um, on my job is if somebody's unaware that they've shared data that they didn't mean to, right? We want to make mm -hmm. it extremely clear, concise, simple, using simple language for, for everybody. And I, and I you know, and, and 
talk to hundreds of other egg technology companies. I know they feel the same, right? Most of them do want to, they want to create that, that ecosystem where, where farm data can be shared and used um, and, you know, and farmers get to benefit from doing that. Yeah. Um, can I uh, sorry, jump mm -hmm. in Go here? Ahead, yeah. On what I'm yeah. Okay, great. So I just, I'm, we're having a conversation actually, Chuck Barish and Haggerty Creek is leading a talk tomorrow about any farmers who want to start talking about carbon and I've asked them if I can <laughs> join on to that and maybe have a discussion after. So I encourage you maybe to come out to that. But there are these Web3 and blockchain companies who have foundations, right, with money and funding, and they want to start creating some of these. So that's, for instance, the Hidera network I've been speaking to. And they said, you know, if you can find farmers, I'm not overselling it here, but if you can find farmers that are you know, willing to give that consent, they're practicing regenerative ag, that maybe have been sequestering carbon and have corresponding samples, and are willing to, you know, mint that carbon as an asset, you know, and then put that on the open market or see or be selling it to someone who's willing to buy it. You know, we think there's a market and we think that there's buyers ready, lined up for high quality, you know, carbon products. So what I'm saying is, again, maybe that's a pipe dream and maybe that won't necessarily materialize. But let's start thinking about, you don't necessarily need to wait again for the government or digitization or standardization or all these like buzzwords you've been using. With the, with the decentralization of the way the internet's going and from, instead of being a subscriber where you buy the field, management software, you pay that subscription fee, you feed your data into it under the guise of, well, this is going to improve the product for you anyway, so you might as well supplement that data. Let's shift it to, no, I have this data set and Rob, maybe it's in a spreadsheet and you say, I'm going to sell this spreadsheet of data on that market, see what value is assigned to it, who's willing to buy it as is. And if it's not clean or they want it feature engineered, you know, let's work with someone to get it fixed up and then sell it to that person again. So I just want, instead of, you know, I think farmers internalize are responsible for a lot of external, externalities that consumers are actually causing, you know, when it's environmental externalities, when it's um, who's getting the most value out of the food chain, oftentimes it's farmers who are not standing to benefit. And I think it's really time we say, instead of the retailers and the consumers, you know, dictating what happens going forward, you know, let's try and take a stand and say, how can we create an additional revenue stream on farm today that hopefully offsets all the rising input costs? <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yeah, of course. Um... Raj, I just want to draw you back in on, on this a little bit, because I, you mentioned in your earlier comment about, you know, working with, uh, you know, I guess larger companies in the system that are trying to, to trying to put together their, their, of course, their value chain and understand information within it. And then, you know, of course, that, in, that involves people at all kinds of different levels. But, you know, the comment has come up a few times about the a voluntary space and driven by companies, driven by, you know, folks who are, uh, you know, organizing their supply chains versus more regulatory uh, environments that will, will be a stick driven, uh, you know, enforcement of different sustainability elements. And I guess I, I want to get your, try to dig into that a bit more to understand your experience in terms of how far along we've gotten in, in terms of this, in terms of the more voluntary space and just how, how evolved this has become, but also like maybe where it also, like if we're looking broadly internationally, the, the, the advantage this might bring because the, you know, agriculture value chains are not linked, limited to one country. And I know you guys have been working internationally. Uh, so the, you know, the challenges of that, challenges or opportunities it brings to have, uh, you know, these data systems that are, are, of course, global in nature and can, can drive, uh, you know, drive relationships that are not limited into one regulatory environment. So um, just, yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on this, this voluntary space, but also that role, the evolving role of, of, uh, of leading companies and defining what is going to be needed to, what's going to be needed to be provided uh, by those along the supply chain. Okay, a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, voluntary space versus publicly driven space and then global disparities. So voluntary space, right? I'd say over the past few years, uh, there's been a lot of activity on the voluntary side, particularly around things like examination of traceability. Um, I'd say the bottom line is, is that most folks don't see blockchain as necessarily the answer for that. But then honestly, there's really no answer in some sense because no one's really willing to pay for it. So, it, you know, so there's a global problem about this notion of I want to know where my food comes from and all the things in between. But when it comes down to it, you know, is Walmart paying for it? Is Aldi paying for it? Is it, you know, Mars and on and on, right? In some sense. So the voluntary side of it has explored ways to look at you know, whether it's blockchain or other technologies to understand what it is to create transparency in a digital record. So I think the answer is 
more work and understanding the cost structure and the value that comes out of it. Is it a consumer value? Is it a regulatory value? Mm. Is it a supply chain efficiency value? And you know, the answer is a little bit of yes on all of those and so on. So that's one. Publicly, that's a harder one, you know, largely because it's very, very difficult to figure out what the alignment per government is, let alone intra-government, right? Just in the United States, you have FISMA and you have USDA and you've got FDA and you've got all these mm -hmm. agencies that have varying ways in which to deploy help to the um, agricultural sector. Right now, all eyes are figuring out what's the COVID impact and how do I deal with disruption? So all of this transparency is an overlay to help solve it but it's not necessarily being funded you know, quickly. The funding is there. You just have to go through a lot of hoops to get it. Um, and so, yes, there's activity, particularly around Web um, you know, 3 and, and other you know, like broad-based, um, publicly accessible technologies. Governments abroad, that's a whole different creature. You know, what the EU does versus the UK, you know, or India or multiple countries in Africa, it's almost impossible to align. So you have to look mm -hmm. towards larger, like the world, you know, the, the World Food Association, the UN, and so on, and, and the World Bank to figure out, okay, is there funding? Is there some kind of commonality that you can put together? And because the food system is so vast and so varied. And you've got different players at different levels, whether large enterprises to the individual farmer that's sitting in Uganda. It's it's so hard to put all that together. But like the good news is, I'd say over the past four years, a ton of work has been done to figure out well, what's that next step towards transparency? You know, a, a digital record is important, but the next step is really to just go well. How do I create ecosystems that normalize the activity in some fashion so that everyone can participate by you know equal joining, equal participation, true part, uh, you know, protection on the, the uh, privacy, and then ultimately what are the equity incentives that actually make sense. So that day is coming. And I really, I mean, we heard about it a few times in the earlier discussion, the concept of interoperability and like, I, I don't know what you, but it seems, or, and I'd love to hear anyone's take on this. We have only a few minutes left, but it seems like it's a really nebulous definition of like what it would mean to be interoperable and I see, I see the discussion gets caught up often in like, oh, do we need standards that define, you know, a uniform, uh, you know, set of data inputs that, that are all the same and that, that, that help to, to make things more normalized. But to me, I wonder if it's, we're more talking about just the ability for things to communicate with one another, like a, a seamlessness uh, of, of the information moving between different providers. How, I'll take all comers here. But how would we actually define this this vision of an interoperable system that allows us to unlock some of that value? Because in a way, I think we're tripping up a little bit on this this more nebulous definition, and it makes it hard to kind of make progress. Okay, yeah. and if you don't, like uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I would like I'll be brief. I mean, I'll just yeah. go, Kate. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You know, I mean, we've uh, we've been in a pilot with GS1, a two stage project where IBM's Food Trust, Walmart, <clears throat> Bumblebee Foods, you know, a number of really large entities looked at two steps. How do you create data interoperability using GS1 standards and EPSIS tags so that you can say. So when someone looks at you know a fillet of fish, you know whether it's cod or whatever, everyone's talking the same language. So the exchange of data based on data standards is, is fairly straightforward, even if you have disparate systems populating a single traceable record, right? In terms of data gaps, the second phase was to look at well, what is the the uh, the technology um, interoperability? You know, for blockchains, it is a real like for traditional databases and network systems, you have adapters and you have a whole series of things where you can manage that. With blockchains, the problem is it's a native technology problem. So you, it, you would have to have the underlying platforms like Corda and Hyperledger and Ethereum and Solana to actually write potentially a new protocol because proof of work or proof of stake or proof of existence and all of these those have to be reconciled at a coding level, which doesn't exist. And all these platforms are looking at it uh, in terms. And so the third parties that enable that cross function of data, you know, across the blockchain, uh, you know, environments. So the food, the food system is not ready to deal with that particular problem. You want interoperability. So you have gateways so that you can think that you can join large networks and take advantage of these things. But that's a, tef, a wholly separate matter. But data interoperability based on standards is, is feasible. Sorry, I didn't mean to take so long. One last shot, I'll take either Kate or Darcy and then we'll have to wrap up. 
Hey, I'll go. Well, really yeah, I have to go ahead. You're a farmer. <laughs> from, uh, from our perspective, and I, I, you know, I do take the perspective of, from ag expert from a customer perspective. Um, interoperability is just the ability to share data um, amongst amongst different applications that you derive value from. And we want to make sure that farmers can share their data in a transparent, trusted ecosystem where the value proposition is clear. Uh, and that's, you know, I'll, I'll get it really, that's as simple as I can make it because I'm curious on Kate's opinion if we have time. Yeah, no, my opinion, I think this interoperability at all these different points, the blockchain is probably not for our scope here, but I think just the fact that, for instance, if right now I drive, let's say, a Case IH piece of equipment, and all of a sudden I need a part, I mean, I'm watching on Twitter, right, these farmers say, okay, I need this part, it's a hydraulic pin, I don't know the name of the part or the, the number of the part, and they go to an app on their phone, they try and look up that part number, and that app has buggy and it's not syncing, it's not even mm -hmm. working anymore, and then you've got like these um, ag technician rates you have to pay, maybe they don't even come out and helping them to your tractor sitting you know, idle during this time. So there's interoperability from um, just even like within a brand or from you know, implement to implement or um, this idea of you know, how, to, how do we create data that can talk to each other. But you know, I think that Rob's point, we can't go wrong with um, a good old spreadsheet. In most cases, you can make a spreadsheet go through any type of <laughs> platform or program. But um, yeah, sorry, I'll just leave it yeah, at that. No, wonderful. Um... Thanks everyone for, for joining today. I think we're getting the, the hook here in a second from the City Age folks, but it was a great conversation and uh, certainly points to both an exciting area, but also one where there's a ton of work left to do to, to put all these pieces together and, and create that value. And, and definitely look forward to following developments in the near future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. to our audience at home, you're watching Foods Future, building a digital food chain. Thank you to our sponsors also, Bio Enterprise, Emily, FCC, and Pro Agrica. I'm your anchor today, Zara Alani. Now let's take a look at the results to our last poll question. It looks like audience results were quite spread apart. Uh, now we do have one final question for you. It's gonna pop up on your screen. The question is, what is the biggest benefit of digitization? You have your options there. Please choose the best answer and then we will reveal the results later on in the episode. Now to our last panel discussion, which focuses on consumers and digitization. It's where we will look at the effects of digitization and where the food system ends. Our panel will discuss how digitizing our food system changes how people shop for groceries and make better food choices, plus the quality of the food that they choose. There are four panelists in our discussion. First, we have Harjeet Bajaj. Harjeet is the president and CEO of Saver Metrics. Saver Metrics develops artificial intelligence-driven food quality detection technologies, redefining metrics for food sector companies and allowing them to make smarter data-driven decisions that lead to reduced shrinkage and increased profits. We also have Olga Pavlovchuk, the CEO at PNP Optica her dream company. She founded the company with her father in 2004. Now over the past six years, she pivoted the company to focus exclusively on building quality and safety solutions for the food processing industry. Olga is driven by the opportunity to combine emerging hardware and software technologies to significantly improve the nutritional quality, safety, and sustainability of our food. Our next panelist is Nisha Sarvaswaran, the CEO of Halifax-based Kraken Sense, which is developing a real-time automated pathogen detection platform. She's an experienced entrepreneur focusing on hard science. And our panel host today is Dana McCauley, recently appointed to the Canadian Food Innovation Network as Chief Customer Experience Officer. Her resume includes successful launches working with international food companies, entrepreneurs, and SMEs alike. Dana was an on-air judge for two seasons of the reality show, Recipe to Riches, where consumers competed to have their home recipes turned into Loblaw products. Thank you all for being here. Dana, I'll pass it on over to you. Thank you so much. And um, this is a, a really great panel to, to get to interact with just in the few minutes we had interacting to get organized, I, I learned a ton. So I, uh, I hope that everyone will get as much out of this discussion as, as I did. I thought I already knew a lot about the topic, but we've got three really dynamic entrepreneurs approaching different problems using technology. And uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll all feel quite hopeful about the food system after this conversation. I'm going to jump right in and uh, put you guys on the spot. 
So as leaders of business to business companies, you each have a focus to sell to producers, processors, manufacturers. So you're not um, necessarily communicating with consumers, but you need to make those sales by identifying the value proposition that your technology offers to them. So uh, I know that we just heard a little bit about what your companies do for businesses, but if you can each just quickly go around the, uh, the, the panel and let us know how your technology helps consumers and uh, accommodates their needs and, and pain points, that would be fantastic. So Harj, I hope you don't mind. I'm gonna start with you because you're the first, first face I'm seeing on my screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dana. That's a really good question. Um, well, for, for us, everything uh, in our sales process starts with understanding what is it, uh, how does this impact the, the con end consumer? So even if we're speaking to a customer that's a retailer or a food processor, uh, invariably our, our business requirement documents start with that piece. And um, everything at the end of the day ties back to consumer satisfaction for all of our customers. And the sooner we get to that point in the conversation, the better for us. And very quickly, we're able to then get to what uh, what product, uh, what technology needs to be deployed. You know, whether it's my produce, you know, does it last as long as I expected, which is shelf life oriented uh, requirements from consumers, or, you know, there was a worm inside of my, my produce. These are the sort of quality metrics at the end of the day, um, impact the end consumer. And of course, uh, our customers want to be able to detect for that. So beyond that, our, our technology is about predicting. So it's not just detecting mm -hmm. what defects are there, but can we predict what is there? In that case, then it's not, uh, it's no longer uh, just a benefit uh, to the consumer, but it's also a, a benefit to our customer as well, because they can then push the requirements further uh, down the, or up the supply chain, so to speak. And hopefully that has a consumer benefit and having, you know, the best quality food on the shelf at the best price too. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's great. Thanks for for explaining that to us, Nisha. Pathogens, obviously, no one wants to get sick, uh, so it seems pretty obvious. But maybe the way you do it and why you do it is is not as obvious. Uh, it's been a really long process, and at Kraken Sense, we're really focused on rapid pathogen detections in the food industry. So the way that they currently test at the, mar at the system is they'll take a sample uh, from the food sample, send it to a lab, um, culture it for three days, meaning grow the bacteria for three days, and then get the results. But if there's an elevated level, what happens is all three days of product has to be destroyed. So the whole reason for this is because there is not an online solution. And that's what we've built up because we're really focused on reducing the food prices as much as possible and in increasing food safety. And being able to test rapidly ongoing every five minutes getting your results means that you can make sure that every single sample um, is of the certain quality that you're looking for. So you can make sure that you're having good quality product, you're reducing your food waste, you're reducing your carbon impact, and the customer is ultimately very happy eating their salad and their burger, right? Because all they wanna know is it's safe and that's all that they care about. But how we go about it is what we're really focused on. Yeah, I can imagine you know, that uh, ability to embed trust into your brand is extremely, extremely important to your, your customers. So Olga, um, you uh, approach using you know, similar types of systems, uh, but to detect foreign objects. So how, uh, how, how is your value proposition important to, to the consumer? Do they care as much about foreign things being in their food as they do about pathogens? Is it a different type of concern, a different kind of consumer? Um, so uh, to answer your question, yes, if you found a piece of plastic in your salad, would you want to eat it? Uh, so consumers absolutely do care about um, uh, foreign objects. What, uh, what our technology does is uh, uh, during uh, production of food or processing of food, uh, we're able to look at the chemistry uh, in high precision uh, and see things that don't belong on the food or even see some signatures of, of um, composition of, of the product itself. So um, how we kind of uh, provide that information to our customer, who is the processor who eventually packages the food, um, they can benefit from increasing their safety, 
uh, they can benefit from increasing their efficiency of production. So for example, if you're making a hot dog, you want to put just enough protein, enough spices and things like that. So we can provide that information. Uh, and lastly, similar to, to what uh, Harjeet was uh, saying, we're also uh, able to provide a little bit of quality measurement. So for example, there is a condition mostly in uh, US uh, grown chickens uh, where the muscles atrophy a little bit and become what's called woody breast. Uh, we are able to predict that and you know, divert the, the chicken breast that's possibly questionable to a different product and it doesn't reach the consumer in a sandwich which would be a very bad experience, obviously. Uh, so those are kind of the, uh, you know, being able to measure, digitize, and assess the information in production, we're able to uh, really influence the end user or consumer's uh, experience of the food. Um, and eventually, you know, uh, and I'm sure Harjeet and I can, can talk about this uh, forever, but food is chemistry, we eat it because we need the chemicals. So as you um, develop equipment that is able to really look at that chemical composition of food, we can now talk about nutrition uh, labels, uh, you know, uh, flavor profiles, things of that nature that we really never had opportunities to measure continuously. And I think that's where we will see more and more changes in consumer behavior because we can- And I want to talk more about that in a few minutes because I, I think that is, you know, so exciting and, and that there's so much interesting, um, yeah, it, 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 so much better information we can bring to consumers in the future using those kinds of tools. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I've been a marketer for a long time and I've surveyed consumers about new products and, and it's consistent that when I go out there with a team or even read somebody else's research, that consumers tell us that natural is what they want, organic is what they want, and they tend to feel and you know, marketing is all about activating people's emotions. They tend to feel that those products are healthier and better and cleaner. But we know that that isn't, you know, that the risk in the in the supply chain doesn't always um, go the way consumers are are assuming. So, I'm really curious to hear about how the type of technology that you have developed, how it can help to to make foods less risky and, and maybe allow us to adopt more, you know, natural and, and less um, products that have had less, I guess, chemical and mechanical intervention. So Nisha, uh, if you don't mind, I'll start with you on this one. Thank you, Dana. I'm a mom to three young kids and I'm a huge believer in clean farming methods. And I'm really excited to see the industry going towards greater sustainability and organics but this can lead to a lot of problems in the supply chain. The food processing industry is really built around standardization with chemicals and heat treatments, and that's how we make sure everything is safe. But the organic mission really doesn't fit that way, right? So when you have uh, foods that are not filled with preservatives and having lots of treatments, the inconsistencies can be really uh, dramatic. So that means mm -hmm. from batch to batch, it has a lot more variations. And so doing just one sample collection per day is really not good enough to ensure food safety because bacterial growth can be massive in a couple of days. And so for our system, because we basically draw um, from the food production system in line and then sample continuously, you're able to see um, the levels changing. And if you're having a problem, you're able to clean, you're able to treat the system and have a much smaller impact. And I think a more rapid and data-centric approach to organic uh, supply chain is a very important thing that we have to all look at. Use your fingerprints to unlock. Good to know. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting. Olga, um, do you agree with Nisha? Do you have any uh, other perspectives to add? Um, uh, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, the uh, approach of sustainable farming and smart farming definitely is probably go. I would like to see uh, that minimizing the need for, you know, distinction between organic and, and not organic uh, farming. Uh, I think the less, uh, the, the more prescribed the chemistry is that we put on our food, the, the healthier everyone is going to be, including the planet. 
Um, where I'm seeing our technology fitting in is, uh, again, be, being able to predict composition and, and maybe things like uh, shelf life and flavor. Uh, so already some of the projects that we've been involved with, uh, we're able to predict shelf life of a batch of a particular vegetable. Uh, so if we're looking at more sustainable ways of uh, uh, growing these uh these vegetables, can we also look at sustainable use of them? So if there, if something is going to, you know, survive only five days, should we transport it across the continent or should we transport it only, you know, to, to the next province or the next state? And I think those logistics uh, will be um, resolved better when we have more information. And I hope, you know, at the end of the day, the food industry supply chain is so complex that I don't think we'll be able to simplify it to you know just something within our driving range. Uh, so how do we use the information about nutrition, survey, the survivability, uh, and so forth to, to then uh, distribute the product as efficiently as possible? Yeah, that's um, big questions, big questions. How did I, I saw you nod and have some changes in your facial expression. So I feel like you have some value to add to this, this question too. Uh, de definitely, Dane. I, um, Nisha hit on a, an interesting point there. She called it an organic uh, supply chain. So yeah, that's one of the things that we talk about on our end as well. So at the end of the day, the consumer wants to validate that the product that they've received is organic, uh, organically grown, right? So you, you cannot guarantee that it's been shipped and, and it's maintained its organic properties. So there is a huge opportunity along that supply chain to be able to pick up what's happening to that produce, whether it's uh, stored, whether it's being packaged and then repackaged and handled a certain way. There's so many, so many nodes along that supply chain where you and can consumers add Consumers don't know about that, do they? Isn't that interesting? I, it's, it's a hidden layer in the, uh, in, in the life of a, of a food product. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have this little video, we call it the, you know, the, the life of a kiwi, and it's just a little animation, but it, it just shows everything that that poor kiwi goes through by the time it gets to you, even though it was, you know, grown the right way, a certain way and plucked at a certain time. Um, so is there an opportunity for technology companies to start playing along that supply chain, increase the amount of data that we have along that supply chain? And, you know, and that's a, that's a play for a lot of companies to come together and collaborate and build up that data. So that level of transparency can be provided through that whole supply chain. But having said that, I mean, how do you, as the saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. So I think there are many points that Olga made and, and, and Nish has made as well. I think you have, you have to tackle it from a number of different perspectives so that you can predictively identify at the end of the stage that was this product truly organic or not? And what are the impacts of that, uh, of, of whatever may have happened during that, that process? You know, very quickly, an example, you know, of that would be the, the, the sesame seed issue that we've had recently probably grown the right way but due to you know an external stressor like covid and the impact on the supply chain uh product held for a longer period of time um regulatory requirements for using certain type of chemicals for pre extended preservation were perhaps overlooked or, or changed and without that visibility to every uh, organization within that supply chain that is going to now use that to ingredient in their product uh, the only time it's realized now is when public health picks it up. So there definitely uh, are technologies like seamless plug, like our technology and technologies that Oga and Anisha and others have that uh, could be deployed along the supply chain that can start providing that sort of um, predictive red light, yellow light type of uh, insights to to everybody within the supply chain. So, so interesting. And, um, you know, my, my next question is about looking ahead and I'll, I'll be curious to, to uh, probe a little deeper with what you just said and ask you, do you see a time in the future where consumers or at least industry will, will have those kinds of dashboards like the red light, green light that you said, uh, talked about, and that we will start to track how, how the, we've decreased the number of recalls, decreased the number of warnings. Uh, is that an end goal for Saver Metrics? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the starting goal. And uh, indeed, mm -hmm. that's the, the end goal as well. So we know that, that the biggest issue uh, for organizations is shrinkage, meaning out of spec product, whether it's due to spoilage or it's due to being just uh, uh, out of spec because certain metrics don't, uh, don't align with what the end consumer is looking for or the next uh, party in the supply chain is looking for. It has to start from there. And in order to get to that point, various types of technologies are required to be able to monitor certain biochemical and biophysical type signatures. And then how does that correlate to the next individual within that line? I know it's 
complex and it would be, you know, a, it almost sounds like a Black Mirror episode in order to be able to get all of that together. But again, you can chip into that. And if you use AI, I know it's an overused word, but if you can use AI the right sort of way, meaning in the in the sort of sense where you're now predicting things, you don't have to be 100% accurate all the time, but if you can highlight red, yellows, and, and, and greens, mm -hmm. um, you can definitely start chipping into the problem significantly. Interesting. Wow. The brave new world, as you, you know, say, the sci-fi uh, uh, element is, um, yeah, we're, we're living in, we're living in the future, aren't we, in some ways. Olga, we're not there, though, and you alluded to this earlier, when it comes to nutrition facts panels and the information that we have about the, uh, the potentially the bioavailability of the nutrients that are listed on a, uh, a food packages label, whether it be a commodity or a, a you know, value added product. And I think that you see your technology having an application in the future that could make that kind of, if not customized and individual nutrition information, at least the what, you know, we, we currently have that that broad information make it much more meaningful to to consumers and, and help them to make better decisions. Can you tell us how that might, uh, might unfold? Um. I can try. Uh, as you said, we're, we're now in definitely. <laughs> Pretend you're situation. talking to a five-year-old. That's about uh, the level I'm at. Here. But uh, well, one one thing that uh, has always been interesting to me that other other processes like pharma the pharmaceutical uh, industry can measure their ingredients, whereas we still frankly predict oftentimes the nutritional labels in the back of our cereal box you know uh, are derived from basic formulas and people just assume certain things and oftentimes the, the labels don't even reflect what it is that you're eating it might be what the ingredients were which obviously we process things between start and finish uh, so what would the world look like if we could measure um, the nutritional value of the food as it's being packaged or maybe even in store. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the, the easiest response is imagine we all had a tricorder uh, for, I hope most people have watched Star Trek, spectroscopy and some of these uh, uh, bio, um, act, you know, biosensors can provide that kind of information. The question is how soon can we actually look forward to something like mm -hmm. that? And frankly, how much time do we as consumers want to spend analyzing every piece of food that we eat? So, but it's a great brand opportunity if I own food company ABC and I can tell people that my product is so much better because I have this great technology. And you know? I think that's what we're going to see, right? Like we're already seeing the, the companies that, you know, um, the price is right, but maybe you do assume that safety might be a little bit compromised. I think we're seeing that differentiation. And what mm -hmm. I'm seeing in my customers is that there is a type of customer that really pays attention to their brand and what they're providing their uh, customers. So I think that will continue spreading and will continue to become more and more important because I think we consumers are much more educated than we have been. Yes, I think so. I think so. Nisha, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, you are, you know, certainly uh, have your eye on the future as well. Do you want to help us to understand what the future of pathogen detection might be and where you're, you see it evolving and, and adding more value to, to the consumer as well as the producer and, and value add uh, uh, intermediary between them? Yeah, thanks, Dana. I'm, I'm really really more obsessed with efficiency and when you you know go and catch a fish and you put it through the processing system i don't want that to get wasted i want every single protein that we harvest every single vegetable that we have is to be utilized um, as best as possible right um, and so the technologies that we're talking about enabling to do rapid analysis really gives us a nutritional value the safety values quickly that means if the a fish has a higher level the bacterial colony, for instance, it may last two weeks on the shelf life. Um, and the next one might only last three days in the shelf life because the levels are so high and it's exponentially mm -hmm. growing. 
So what we want to be able to do is utilize that fish, you know, by cooking it or like turning it into jerky or turning it into dog food. But ultimately, it doesn't end up wasting, right? right. We can't feed 7 billion people with organic foods. I remember Olga mentioning this, but we can be a lot more efficient. And the cost of food rising and, you know, we're constantly adding more, but the, also the companies are facing this brand damage. One little tweak can destroy, you know, a 50 year old company. And so you're trying to figure out how can we add technology to their supply chain that enables them to do what's right, enables them to reduce less food, enables them to protect and provide quality products, right? And that that's really what's, they're still working with 1970s technology most of the time and it's not gonna yeah. change overnight. And we're all working towards helping to modify that slowly. Well, this has been fast, but super informative. I, I've got a few takeaways. I, I heard that, you know, the types of, of technologies that you're introducing into the processing and uh, manufacturing spaces are definitely making food safer. It's also making the um, production of, of uh, food less wasteful. And it's giving us, you know, great decision making tools that we, you know, never had before. The, the sniff test can be put to rest is what I'm hearing here. So thank you so much for your time. I, I see there's a, a few things have popped up here and there in, in the chat. Hopefully uh, the three of you will have a chance to, to look at those. And um, Zara, thank you very much. Uh, I see you here. So that must be my cue to say <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for our entire panel for that riveting conversation. We appreciate you being here. Now let's take a look at the results from our last poll. It looks like most of our audience was split between option two and three. Now, as we wrap up today's episode, I want to thank our guests, attendees, and of course, to our sponsors, Emily, BioEnterprise, ProAgrica, and Farm Credit Canada. Thank you so much for your support. That concludes our Foods Future Steer series. Stay tuned for more information about our spring series, looking at regenerative farming, food security and waste, and urban agriculture. City Age will continue to come to you virtually as we've done since the start of the pandemic. Our mission is to bring together leaders who are building the future. Now, if you have an idea or a topic to feature on City Age, please do get in touch with us. Look for updates on cityage.com and the recording from today's event will be available soon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Zara Lanny. <laughs>